Okay, good evening, persons of quality. It is November 30th, and it is the day that I introduced the Wife of Bath's prologue to us in class. Now, uh, here is my opportunity to give us some better context as to what's going on, what I think are the important ideas. So we take a look at the Wife of Bath's prologue as we did the first 180 or so lines in class. It provides an introduction to the medieval ideas about marriage and love. It's very different than what we know 20th, 21st century. Significantly different ideas. We know that it begins like a sermon uh, and then takes on the terms of misogyny and misogamy. Misogyny is M-I-S-O-G-Y-N-Y. And misogamy is M-I-S-O. G-A-M-Y. Now, I actually went through and I specifically looked up misogamy in my uh, Google set of terms so that I was on the same page. And I am absolutely going back and I'm looking that up right now. Misogamy is defined as the hatred of marriage. Misogamy is the hatred of marriage, and I think this is going to play a significant idea in Chaucer's criticism. So we know it begins like a sermon, and the wife of Bath describes her first three marriages. This is not where we got to class today. We stopped short of this. So this is going to be good for your context. So as she describes these three marriages, she demonstrates her success in manipulating the marriage system to her own advantages as a means to consolidate money and power. So the wife of Bath very clearly establishes that for the woman, it was about consolidating power. It was a grab for as much power as a woman could uh, assume in the Middle Ages, which specifically speaking, is not a ton. When she speaks of her fourth and fifth husbands, and this is where I think it's very different, uh, it becomes more personal. Like uh, she's describing her own life. She's giving us her own views on the role of love and marriage and its relationship to the gender social structure. So the first three are very linear. The fourth and fifth husband, this is designed very specifically to show us what she feels about uh, relationships and love and what those ideas mean. Now, remember, there is no real concept of romantic love in the uh, medieval period. So this is something completely uh, outside the box for Chaucer. So I think that's very significant. The wife of Bath defends marriage against all these religious teachings. And that's what we covered in class uh, on November 30th. We specifically went over what those complaints are about what the Bible says, what church teaching says about remarrying once the husband uh, has died. And I think that's incredibly significant. Uh, the prologue presents both the challenges to women's power, women's, it's called agency, women's agency, uh, that medieval marriage supposes is going to be the rule. So a woman has to give up all of her sovereignty in order to be married. Uh, and I think that's a huge cornerstone to what Chaucer is trying to tell us. We know that marriage teachings and practices in the late medieval English culture, were there, they weren't uniform. They were very different depending on what class you belonged to, what kind of money you had, what access to resources. So even though we have this, uh, this belief that uh, marriage is a specific thing, it certainly supports the men. Marriage is a system that protects the power of men. And I think that's significant. 
So again, that's going to be something that we want to pay attention to as we go. So, as I'm looking at my notes here, marriage did not require intimacy, and it was much more, and, and it didn't have anything about mutual love. It was an, a partnership for the advancement of both men and women socially. So medieval marriage was designed for the social advancement of both parties. Of course, the way it actually played out is that emphasized the male advancement and not so much uh, the female. And I think that's significant. So there's a lot going on here in these idea, ideas. We know that the wife of Beth's prologue manipulates existing conventions of marriage. It challenges that social norm. And again, we covered a lot of that in class and we will continue with these ideas on December 1st and December 2nd. So I think that's very significant to our understanding. All of this provides a model for social change uh, that is not radical, but necessary and only in small little baby steps. So the wife of Beth's prologue provides a model for social change. Now I've said that in class, I'm gonna say it again here, is that the wife of Beth's prologue provides a model for social change. Now my hope here is that you are taking notes and can reference back to these major ideas once uh, we get into the tale, uh, so we can kind of connect the prologue to the specific tale. So, continuing with the notes I had a moment ago, not only did the medieval legal system treat wives as inferior, clearly what the wife of Beth refers to in her prologue, there was a colorful genre of anti- matrimonial writing that advised men to marry on the grounds that wives were intolerable. So there was a whole theme in medieval literature that said marrying was stupid. And if you did decide to marry for the, you know, furthering of the species or for whatever reason, that you were making a bad choice and that whoever you chose was intolerable. Remember, the idea, the concept for marriage for love is foreign during the Middle Ages, during the medieval period. And so we got a lot of context here saying that marriage is bad. So this idea that the literature was based around the idea that marriage was intolerable. And if you did, women, wives in general, did nothing but nag and were nothing but ptarmigent and problematic. This kind of writing typically painted a picture of the woe of marriage. Woe is W-O-E. A phrase used by Chaucer's wife of Bath in the opening lines of her prologue. We went over this in class on November 30th, so it should have been nice and clear. I think it's the third line of her prologue. Uh, so I think that's significant. There's an interesting little anecdote here, and these are always fun for these videos. There, at this time, there was a wildly, widely, not wildly, a widely circulated example of this kind of writing. Uh, I'm just reading over my notes. It was by Theophrastus, T-H-E-O-P-H-R-A-S-T-U-S. Theophrastus. This is where you get your geek on. Theo, T-H-E-O, Phrastus, P-H-R-A-S-T-U-S. Theophrastus, who is named as a source in this work called the Book of Wicked Wives. Wicked is W-I-K-K-E-D. It's an old phrase. So it's Theophrastus wrote a work called the Book of Wicked Wives. Uh, and it's also uh, so that Jenkins reads to the wife in her prologue. So that's the book that uh, Jenkins doesn't want her to take from him. Very interesting how that works. So I think that's an interesting idea. So 
widely circulated ideas that marriage was bad for men, but women needed it. And I find that very, very significant as an idea. So as I go back through my notes here, uh, this is Theophrastus' work is highly anti-matrimonial. It building on the association of marriage with undesirable consequences. Anti-matrimonial writing depicts wives as uh, terrible, as, as unhappy, discontent, nothing works for them. They're unfaithful, they're vain. They want to achieve and acquire stuff. And they are unforgivably talkative. Now, looking at this, I don't know why being unforgivably talkative is a problem. But this was certainly an opportunity to disparage wives in a very general sense. Refuting a possible practical reason for marriage, these works assert that wives are inferior managers of the household compared to male servants. Not even to the husband, but compared to male servants. And they show that the bad reputation of marriage is tied to both negative views of identity and to the cliques, the cliques of medieval misogyny. So it refers to everything bad written at this time about marriage. So I think very significant context here to look at in these ideas. So I think these are going to be relevant concepts just for a sense of context. So my hope here is that this is the third and final piece of this particular video. So if I'm looking at the Wife of Bath's prologue, here's a little more context to help us through that. The wife begins her prologue by claiming that her authority to speak on marriage is justified by her experience. That's those first couple of lines. So I think that's an interesting idea. So based on her experience, as opposed to her ability to interpret the Bible. So she's critical of all these other people in the prologue, the general prologue, and also in the tales who rely on the Bible, rely on illusions and all of this to develop uh, those particular ideas. Uh, and she attributes all of this to the fact that she's been married several times. So that's important. But regardless of this, the first part of the Wife of Bath's prologue resembles a marriage sermon in its use of biblical allusions, quotations, and interpretations to defend marriage. So she hooks us by defending marriage using the Bible. Ironic, of course, because no woman or lay, lay married person. Now, of course, you know the difference between clergy and laymen and all that stuff. So... There's no way that a woman or a lay married person could be a preacher in the Middle Ages. So the semblance of a prologue to a sermon uh, is certainly something that we are looking at uh, as a literary idea. The partner is going to talk about it or reference it in his tale. Uh, but again, this is the wife of Bath wouldn't be doing these kinds of things. We know that as the wife of Bath talks, she challenges male privilege. She challenges the idea that men are superior. And she also challenges religious authority on marriage, both by her experience and her command of the tools and strategies of writing. She's, she's very articulate in the way that she develops her concepts. So you want to look at that as you read through your text. By contrast to her account of her first three marriages, the wife claims that she married her last husband, Jankin, G-A-N-K-Y-N, for love and not riches. Now that's a very significant idea. She marries for love and not for money. So what happens in this marriage is going to be Chaucer's larger point. So I think that's very important. 
At first, Jenkins seems to give the upper hand in marriage uh, as he subjects her to readings from his special little book, which we, we, we learn is a misogynistic text. So I think that's very important. The text is about villainous wives in history, so it's setting the tone that wives and women are going to be terrible no matter what. And I find that significant. As you read, the, the, the wife articulates the theory of gender. She talks about gender, gender bias, arguing that if the women had written the stories, and I'm reading the medieval text here, uh, they would have written of men more wickedness than all the mark of Adam may redress. So if women wrote the stories, men would get a much worse portrayal because of the realities of what was what's going on in the day. Her logic is similar to the one that shapes the curriculum in many English departments with classes by, with, with, when we look at female authors, when we look at works written by women, not a whole lot in the first semester of either American lit or British lit, but a significant idea nonetheless. So just as the knight must reject the misogynistic answers to the question of what women want, that's in her tale, we're not there yet. But when we get to the wife of Bath's tale, the knight, the main character is going to develop some specific ideas. The wife's act of tearing the pages out of Jenkins' book of Wicked Wives is symbolic of tearing up all the old ideas. Now, it seems like I made a big leap there, and I did to an extent. So, the wife of Bath, when she marries her last husband, Jenkins, she marries him for love, and even though he has this terrible book about wicked wives, she can let that go. In a fit of pique, P-I-Q-U-E, she tears up the pages in the book and she asserts herself. She asserts that these misogynistic ideas no longer work. It's a symbolic rejection of those stereotypes. And I find that very significant when we look at what she does as we get into the tale. So there's a lot going on here, and I have several more paragraphs that I can include in this, but I'm already roughly at the 18 minute mark, so I wanna stop there, just as a way to give you some context of how to tie the ideas, <clears throat> tie the ideas of the Wife of Beth's prologue to her tale. Now, if you take notes on this, it should clarify some of the directions. 